Hello, this is part three of topic two, atomic bonding in materials engineering mate 210. Today we're going to be talking about the scale of matter, how big atoms are compared to the rest of the things that we're more familiar with, and also what happens when atoms bond to one another. So to start off, we have to understand or appreciate just how small atoms really are. For example, if this were a class in cosmology, we'd be talking about light years, which are 9 times 10 to the 15th meters on the scales of the galaxies and our universe. If we were designing automobiles, we'd be focused on human scale, which is about 2 meters in, in dimension. But atoms themselves are on the order of what we call angstroms. An angstrom is defined as 1 times 10 to the minus 10th meters. And an individual atom is approximately 1.4 angstroms in diameter. That's pretty tiny. If you have the opportunity, I'd encourage you to go to this Nikon flash demo. I'll click it and bring it up so you can see the URL. So here's the URL. If you copy that and paste it into your own browser, you can go to this universe scale demo. To play the demo, click enter on full screen mode. And then you can enter into this demo that talks about how big things are and allows you to click through. We'll skip the introduction. Allows you to click through and just see how big some of these objects are. So if we go to 10 to the 15th, we see at the very far end of the scale is our 13.8 billion light years, the size of our universe. And as we work our way down to smaller and smaller objects, let's say 10 to the 6 meters, we start to see objects that are roughly the scale of planets, such as Mercury or the Moon. When we get down into human dimensions of meters, we start to talk about the pyramids and a Ferris wheel or the Statue of Liberty. But when we get down into small scale objects like ice crystals and the sesame seed, we're starting to have to work with levels of microscopes in order to see things. But we're still not down small enough to atoms. We have to get down into the nanometer range a scale where we have molecules, such as a protein molecule, a dendromer, which is a type of polymer, and a nanoparticle, such as a particle made out of a group of gold atoms. DNA itself is also down at the nanometer scale. A silicon crystal, which is made up of individual atoms of silicon, is about 10 to the minus 8 meters, or 10 nanometers in size. But there are even smaller objects, such as a nanotube. We can learn more about a carbon nanotube by clicking on the image. We can go to an amino acid, which is a molecule made up of individual atoms. And if we wanted to, we could go down even to the individual atom level. This is the model for a hydrogen atom with one electron in its outer shell. That's enough of that. Let's move back to our lecture. But I'd encourage you to check this video flash out. It gives you a good idea of just how small atoms and molecules are compared to other objects in our universe. Well, we also have to understand not just how small atoms are, but just how they organize into the three-dimensional space. So it turns out that atoms organize either individually by themselves or they bond together to form molecules. This creates four different ways that matter is organized. Amorphous molecules are random groupings of molecules that have no regular pattern to them, whereas crystalline molecules are made up of long chains of atoms bonded together by covalent or ionic bonds that form into crystals. We can also have individual atoms that are disordered or amorphous. This, an example of this would be argon gas, where all the individual atoms are spread out and randomly oriented. And lastly, we could have the individual atoms organize themselves into a crystal. There are bonds here, but those bonds don't form molecules. So here the atoms act individually. We'll talk a lot about crystalline atoms throughout the class this quarter.
Looking even more closely at the atoms themselves, we realize that there's really two parts to the atoms, the nucleus and the electron shells. In the nucleus, you have the protons and neutrons, and you should have learned about this in your chemistry classes. We're not going to focus much on this part of the atom. What's important to us are the electrons in their outer shells, because it's these electrons that interact with the outer world of the, that we want to control in order to get material properties to behave a certain way. And what's most important about the atom is the number of electrons in the outermost shell. That outermost shell is also known as the valence shell. So for example, this is a sodium atom, and you can see that it has K shells, L shells, and M shells surrounding the nucleus. And the outermost shell is the M shell, which has one atom in, or one electron in its outermost shell. That's why sodium shows up in the first column of the periodic table. So here's that periodic table and we see sodium sitting there in the first column. Now this is a very special periodic table because it shows not only the elements and where they sit in the periodic table, but the vertical axis is showing us something called the electronegativity. You can see that over here on this vertical axis here, as well as on the vertical axis over here. Electronegativity is a measure of how strongly an atom will bond an electron to it. Now what you notice is that atoms over on the left hand column of the periodic table have very low electronegativity, which means they have a very weak desire to bond electrons to the nucleus of the atom. So sodium doesn't hold on to its valence shell electron very tightly. On the other hand, an element like chlorine has a very high electronegativity, which means it wants very desperately to hold on to its electrons and will even attract other electrons towards it. And that's where salt comes from. The sodium ion gives up its electron easily, and the chlorine ion is desperate to grab onto that electron, and together that forms a bond called an ionic bond. We'll talk more about that later on. But the important thing here is to understand that electronegativity varies as a function of where you sit on the periodic table. And the more you are towards the upper right-hand corner of the periodic table, the higher your electronegativity generally will be. There's something else we need to understand about atoms when they bond and that is the binding energy between the two atoms. So here what we have are two atom cores. So you can imagine this is the atom with its electron shells surrounding it. And we have the distance between the center of the two atoms plotted on this x-axis. On the y-axis we have the energy of the bond. As the energy goes up, the, the bond repels the two atoms apart, and as the energy goes down, they're attracted to each other. So there's a neutral position, we often call R0, where the two atoms are at a minimum energy point between them. Sometimes that's also known as 2R, two times the radius of the atoms. That neutral position has the lowest possible energy state for that bond. As I pull the, the atoms apart, the energy goes up, and the system tries to attract the atoms back together again. If I push the two atoms together, the energy goes up even faster because the electron shells are interacting with each other, and eventually you get a repulsive force and the two atoms try to push back apart. So there tends to be this position in the middle where they want to sit. That neutral position also is correlated to the force between the two atoms. At that neutral position, there's zero force acting between the two atoms. If I try to pull them apart, there's an attractive force that brings them back together. And if I try to push them together, there's a repulsive force that tries to push them back apart. Notice that the energy well is non-symmetric. This is the resistance to atomic fusion. You may have heard of the nuclear fission as the way that we produce nuclear energy. And nuclear fusion is the way the sun combines the cores of two atoms to create higher order atoms. Well, there's a strong force that resists that nuclear fusion, and that's what, why the repulsive force goes up so dramatically as you try to push the atoms together. It turns out that the slope of the force versus distance curve is pretty linear in this portion near the neutral position for the two atoms. And that slope is the derivative of the force over the displacement. Well, if we think about force over change in, change in force over change in distance, and we were to divide those by the cross-sectional area of the bond, and divide the change in displacement by the original length of the bond, we'd have the same thing as stress over strain. And so therefore, the slope of this deflection, this force versus deflection curve is related to, not quite the same, but related to the elastic modulus of the material.
The steeper that slope, the higher the elastic modulus of the material will be. Well, let's take a look. If we plot the melting temperature of a material, which is a direct measure of the strength of its bonds versus the Young's modulus, what we see is that as the bond strength increases, in other words, if I move up in the y-axis, the Young's modulus also increases. So materials with low melting temperatures like polypropylene also have low Young's moduli, and materials like tungsten carbide, which have very high melting points, also have very high Young's modulus. So it makes sense that the bonding, the bond strength, which is directly related to the thermal property of melting point, is also directly related to the elastic property of Young's modulus. There's another interesting correlation that we can compare between Young's modulus and thermal expansion coefficient. What we see is that high Young's modulus materials, or materials with strong bonds, tend to have lower thermal expansion coefficients, whereas materials with weak bonds, like polyethylene terra polytetrafluorethylene, excuse me, or Teflon, has a very high thermal coefficient of expansion uh, and a very low Young's modulus. 